so I'm going to put the first one in answered. Um, oops, so that you can follow along. Okay, I'm the betrayed wife. We have three kids. We are in in an in-home separation for the past year because my husband is not in recovery and I don't feel safe to be in the same room as him. My question is regarding my nine year. Oh, he'll be back. I know what he did. He clicked his headphones to adjust something and he accidentally turned it off. So he'll be back. Hi. Sorry don't about that. touch your AirPods. Okay. So my question is regarding my nine-year-old daughter. I can see that this is affecting her badly. She is really anxious and angry. She started self-harming. I got her a therapist and her therapist is saying that I need to be completely honest with her about what's going on. I've already told my daughter that sometimes even adults need a break from each other, that we really love her. This has nothing to do with her, that it's not her fault. And whatever's happened between my husband and me, we will always love her and she will be okay. But the therapist says it's not enough. And she is still very confused. What do I do? Well, I um, can you hear me, by the way? Can you? Am I, I can. Through? Yes. Okay. Yes. I um, I don't know you or your daughter or your therapist, so I hesitate in you know giving a whole lot of uh, direction. I can just tell you what my belief is: is that under no circumstances would I ever, ever, ever on this planet tell a nine-year-old about my sexual life or my spouse's sexual life. I just think that's abusive. I don't think any child or even young adult needs to know about their parents' sex life. So I don't know what your therapist means by needs to know more, but I can tell you this. I hope they don't mean, nor would I in any way support them, even if I don't know you, talking to your daughter about affairs or porn or she's nine years old. You know, I, even if she was 15, I wouldn't talk. She's your daughter. She's his daughter. I never want to look at my parents and say, oh, right. They had this affair and then there's this thing. And I don't want to know that they're my parents. So. I don't agree with any any concept of bringing this to a child in any way, except you did perfectly. We're not getting along. Sometimes parents don't get along. We're really working on it. Now, I will say it's gone on a long time. And in-home separations a year, that's a very long time. You know, I see people in-home separate for a couple of months. Maybe then they separate more fully. Maybe they start move back together. Um, I think you have some questions you need to ask yourself that have nothing to do with this piece of it, which is why are you remaining with someone in a situation that's hurting your daughter where there's a lot of anger and tension in the house and this man that you care about who i hope cares about his child is not taking any responsibility or taking any action um you know i hate when i have to do this tammy and i think i have this right but sometimes i have to tell spouses you know you're gonna have to do something whether he does or, do or not and if it isn't for you you know you want to wait it out or you have to do something for your daughter because what I would interpret the therapist as saying, or what I would be saying is this long-term separation in the house with the tension and dad's not paying attention. And it, it's the whole feeling of it that would make my kid hurt. And so I, I guess my question back to you is what can you do to protect your child? Um, and is what's going on between the two of you, obviously it's not working for your family. You need to change it. So I would be less interested, in fact, not interested in talking to this child about sex and what's going on in my relationship, even in a casual way. Um, but what I would be doing is thinking, how can I protect her or him better from this tension, from this separation, from this situation? We need to move forward in some way. We cannot leave this sitting here any longer with this child watching it. So that's my question back to you is how can you take better care of your daughter? Um, because she's suffering in this situation and not because she does, needs to know more. Um, she needs someone to protect her more. Um, and that's, anyway, I don't know the situation, but that's just my take. Can, Tammy, did you have a thought? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. I think you've done a, an amazing job of like all of the things that you have said. But what I went back to is what Dr. Rob was talking about too, is I don't feel safe being in the same room as him. So if you are not safe right. in the same room as your husband, you're, but you're living in the same home, you know, those kids are picking up on all of that, you know, and I can imagine coming home from school and feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, you know, the tension has to just right. be eking everywhere. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm too thinking, you know, if he isn't able to step into recovery, isn't willing to step into recovery, then what do you need to do to make this a more permanent thing, you know, so that there is, you know, right. when, when you're, you're providing a safe environment for your kids, but 
but it's that interaction with, you know, and I can only imagine how stressful it is for you. I mean, like to have that right. level of stress for you every single day, you know, with, with him there sounds. I, I do want to agree with please. one thing that the therapist is saying, which is mm -hmm. one of the greatest um, challenges for me as an adult of relating to my childhood was that there was so much illness going on in my family and no one told me. And I would sit around and say, I think this is really, or should that be how, I mean, I was a little kid and I knew something was wrong and they say, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You know, we're just having a little of this and that. And it was clearly more serious. And one of my sort of life wishes, which never came true is I wish at some point my folks had come to me as an adult and said, you know, we really didn't do the best job with you. And this is what we could have done. This is what we didn't do. And I think just knowing that, because there's always this part, like, what did I do wrong? And, you know, why don't they love each other? And no matter how much you reassure them. And so I do think going to her and acknowledging that something is very wrong here and it doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel comfortable to you either, that's acknowledging her reality. You don't have to tell her details, but tell her, yes, this is uncomfortable. Yes. And I want to go back to what I said earlier, which is, and I think this can be motivating, is maybe you're not in a place where you want to do anything about this between the two of you. Maybe mm -hmm. you're in a place where you're hoping or you're showing or you're doing therapy. But this isn't about you now. This is about how do you protect your child from a situation that is not tenable for them. And I think when you take yourself out of it and say, I need to really make sure this child is in a more um, nurture or nurturing is not the right word, um, a less tense, less stressful environment, then you can take your own emotions about your relationship out of it and just look at how you can best take care of your child. Um, but I would not, and I would really question the therapist who says, tell a nine-year-old more about details of that stuff. So it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Two years ago, I trickled disclosed to my wife, my acting out behaviors with porn along the way. I learned more acting out behaviors while working with my CSAT, but I did not let my wife know in July of 22, I was going through the formal disclosure process with my CSAT. And my wife said that she did not want it. So we stopped here. We are in December joining a recovery group. And part of the intake form was to explain all of my abusive behaviors. I told my wife the remaining items and I crushed her again and broke trust. Now for her safety, she is asking that I live out of the house away from her and the kids while we go through this recovery program. She has filed for divorce again, as she says that she needs a divorce on file in case for her safety while we go through the program as in California, it takes six months. How can I best show up for her after crushing her again? What kind of questions or requests can I ask her without minimizing what I have done and not questioning the actions that need to be taken? Well, my first response is just my gut response, which is leave her alone. Like, leave her alone, you know, let her do what she needs to do for herself. You've already caused damage and then you cause more, even though you knew better. Um, you know, you don't have to fill out every form and do every single thing that every group says the minute you get there. You, there is a larger picture, which is what, what about my family? How are we doing? Your wife already said no. I don't care if God himself came down and said, tell her. She said no, and you need to respect that. So um, I... I I think that you didn't crush her trust, by the way, by telling her, you crushed her trust by everything you told her, which she said she wasn't ready for. So I think you have harmed her. I think that I can understand why she doesn't want you around and why she might be thinking about maybe we can't be together. Um, how can you show up for her? Ask her, what can I do for you? Is there anything you want? For, I'm going to work in my recovery. I'm going to don't argue. Don't try to make it better. Don't tell her, well, gee, this and that, and I didn't really mean it. And no apologies, no excuses, no, I'm sorry, no, well, I didn't know what I was doing, or I went through these difficult times, or just leave her alone. Wish her, well, anything I can do, let the door be open to her for what she needs from you, and then deal with your feelings about, because how can I best show up for her uh, when I read the end of this? How can I best show up for her after crushing her again? What kind of questions can I ask her? And not questioning the actions basically you're still saying, how do I make this better? And it isn't up to you. You've already ruined it. You can't make it better. She has to find her own way. And every time you interrupt the process, you make it worse. You can leave a door open for her and say, if you need me, if you're working, you know, if you need me to go to therapy, if you have questions and stuff we need to work on, I'm right here. Let her do her separation. Let her don't interfere. Let her have her space to do what she needs to do for herself. This is what being out of the doghouse means or in the doghouse. I wrote a book about this called Out of the Doghouse. We teach a course called Out of the Doghouse. It's for men to understand how to negotiate a relationship once they have 
defeated in profoundly broken trust. I wrote a book about this. We teach about this. I, I by the way, you might consider the Out of the Doghouse course. It's not expensive, but you know, uh, if you want to learn how to help a betrayed partner begin to heal and feel safe with you again, uh, this is not the way to it. So a couple of things, leave her alone, let her have her own safety, and you need to join some groups. You need, I don't know anything about your recovery, but I don't hear, I didn't hear you say, uh, and I don't know what a recovery group is because I don't know any 12-step program where you're filling out forms. So this must be some kind of therapy thing. Um, I don't know if your CSAT supports it or they don't, but um, yeah, I just, um, I think you need to let her be and let her take care of herself until you're available in any way you can be. Um, but only if she asks and then leave her alone because you cannot make this better. And that's what the end of it is saying. Basically, you're saying, how can I make her feel better? How can I make this better? What is the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do is nothing. <laughs> Don't do anything. Focus on your recovery. And next time you want to talk to your wife, call your sponsor. And I hope you have one or call a bunch of guys together who are in your 12 step group and say, gee, I feel like telling my wife about this, but this is what happened last time. You know, Don't make these decisions on your own. Uh, and I don't, Tammy, see anything about going to meetings, sponsors, I, I don't, 12 steps. I don't see any of that. I, I just see, and I don't even say that as part of the intake form, it told me to tell her to do that. So I can't even blame it on the recovery group. It, it's like, oh, I wrote it down, so I'm going to tell her, you know? So, um, so yeah, I, I just see, I, I you know, I, I get this a lot. Oh, I want to feel better, so I'm going to, I'm going to come clean regardless of the uh, unsafe environment that you've just created for her. So the only other thing I'm going to say is um, she has me living out away from the kids. Do not please um, put the kids in the middle, but show up for the kids, you know, like, like, like it's in my opinion, it's okay. How can I, how can I support you with the children? What, what will be useful? And you're asking, you're, you're not trying to just be manipulative and ingratiate. It's like, how can you show up in a real way? Cause the kids are stuck in the, like the previous question, you know, where it, you know, it's, it's hard for the kids. So, you know, can you show up in a different way, you know, for the kids, leave your wife alone. I agree with Dr. Rob hundred percent, leave her alone, let her have her support and healing. But, um, but I'm, you know, I'm it, like, it's, it's, I just get devastated when I see this AI trickle disclosed to her and, you know, and, and so then I, I just kept, and then you did it again. And, you know, and I get, I get it. I'm an addict, you know, um, but man, we have an opportunity to do things better. And um, so um, I, I hope you have stopped the problematic behavior. If you haven't, we have a treatment program. We help guys, you know, not just stop the problematic behavior, but address those underlying issues. And we have support for family you know, for spouses too. So, um, but the, I put in the chat, I put the link for the um, work groups. We have out of the doghouse, we have inner child, we've got attachment wounds, we've got sex addiction 101, porn addiction 101. We've got so much, Eddie Caparucci, Troy Love, uh, our team, like there's lots of stuff. So please check those out. There's a betrayed partner one that will start again, March 1st. Um, but uh, there is healing, but you know, you got nothing to give until you get the work done yourself. So and she doesn't okay. want anything from you. So, but I want to just jump on what Tammy said. In terms of your kids and your family, just do your job. You're supposed to show up for something, show up for it. Take them somewhere, do something with them, do something with the family. Just show up. I mean, and show up on time and be open to whatever. You know, just be a good spouse and a good dad. Yeah. You consistently don't have to get, why aren't you here yet? Or, you know, why did you pick that up? Or just do your job and go a little extra, not as time you said to see how hard I'm working, but because that's the right thing to do is to just show up and show someone that you are committed and sincere and you know the right road to be on. And then the rest is up to her. And no, um, how's your mom doing? And like, I miss you and your mom. And I'm so sorry. None of that junk either. It's like, you talk to the kids. How's your day? How's your homework going? What? Did, how's soccer? Whatever it is, you're you're all about what's in their life, not a, for you. So, okay, on to the next one. Good evening. I'm a betrayed wife, married 13 years, D-Day 12 years ago. Oh wow, two years ago I set boundaries, and since then my husband has been in and out of sobriety. He is going on and off to 12-step meetings and CSAT. He has now been sober for uh, four months. He did 90 and 90, and he has been going to a CSAT every week. 
He speaks to fellows here and there. He doesn't do any 12 step work and he doesn't do any other recovery work like le re you know, reading books, listening to helpful Zooms or anything else that his CSAT recommends and he doesn't have a sponsor. He needs, he said, he, he says he needs to find someone he can connect to. I, I don't feel like he is in recovery. You're right. I feel like he is a white knuckling. I am asking for perfection. No, I'm being unreasonable. No. That's my interjection on that. Um, I go to meetings daily, listen to podcasts and do everything my CSAT recommends. I don't feel safe. He stonewalls me and goes into shame and victims mode uh, when I bring up my feelings and my needs. So we are in house separation for the past eight months. Oh, I'm so sorry. Dr. Rob, thoughts? Um, yeah, sorry. I got someone just, uh, I might've heard from that person that we're working with in another country, Tammy. Um, I guess got a text from six three. I don't know what that means. Yes. I didn't answer. I, I, um, yeah. But I didn't answer. Uh, oh, it is that person. Um, so uh, Tammy, I'm sorry. I can't do more for her right now because we're doing this. So I'll have to get back to her later. We're working on something online. It's nothing to do with you guys. Sorry. Um, so, so what I hear, I mean, when I read this whole thing, I see your finger and it's pointing at him. You know, he's not doing this and he's not doing that. And I don't feel good with this and I don't believe this. And, and, you know, I don't think that you've observed that, you know, that you see that, how are you going to take care of you? You know, why is this man still in your home? Why are you in a in-home separation? In-home separation is when you're moving toward healing and both of you are doing as much as you can. If he's not doing the things he needs to do, what is the next step? If the next step of things are going well is to do an in-home connection what do you in income what's the happen to separation in home togetherness if that's what you do if things are moving forward do you have a plan for what happens if they don't get better because this seems to me like well if he did that and he did that and then this and then if he did it who knows what he's going to do you didn't know when he was acting out and who knows what he's doing in recovery but what can you do for you and if you don't see the things that make you feel safe how can you feel safer and does it feel safe for him to be in that house and by the way as long as he gets to be in that house why does he have to do anything um, you know, maybe in-home separation doesn't mean anything to him. Maybe for him, it's like, oh, good, I got her off my back. So maybe there needs to be a more, um, what's the word, Tammy, um, concrete step. This feels a little vague. Um, you know, in-home separation, What do you eat meals together? Do you talk to, I mean, anyway, boundaries, clarity, um, too much wistful thinking, not enough action on your part to push away things you're not comfortable with. That's what comes up for me, Tim? Yeah, well, and I, he clearly is, um, he's checked a few boxes, you know, he did 90 and 90. Going to meetings, I just shared with somebody um, a, a little bit ago, um, uh, one of the things I learned early in recovery from the old timers who actually had recovery was the elevator to recovery is broken, please use the steps. I know lots of people who have sat in meetings, warmed seats, for years and guess what they don't have any real recovery they're abstinent but they don't have real recovery so so when you um you said he's been sober for four months okay so that means he, but but i don't hear anything that he you know other than he has stopped acting out for four months you know he's not really working on doing anything that will help create safety that will bring you closer you're doing I'd like somebody used an analogy and I, I used this one the other day I, um, and I wish I knew who to um, attribute it to because I can't remember. But what I hear is exactly this, you know, you're showing up, you guys are both in the boat, you're rowing like crazy. And he's sitting there going like, mm. and guess what? You're going in circles. You know, you're in the same circle because you're paddling like crazy and he's not doing oh. anything and you can't do anything with that. It's, you know, so, so when there's an in-home separation or a therapeutic separation, what is the, what are you looking to see in order to, as Dr. Rob said, reunify in a yeah. different way or move forward or to separate completely because, you know, he'll keep minimally checking boxes. And here's the really sad thing. The really sad thing. I know how painful this is for you as a betrayed spouse, but the really sad thing is he's not in recovery. He's not got the, Part of recovery, we talk about happy, joyous, and free. We don't have to hold on to that shame and all of that toxic stuff if we don't choose to. But unfortunately, um, he's still in that choice. So I'm sorry. 
Okay, next question is, um, thank you for these Zooms. They're so helpful to me. My husband is a sex addict and he has been going to um, SW for um, most of our marriage. I don't know details. Uh, what is SW? I'm blanking. Uh, oh, sex workers, right? Sex workers yeah. for most of our marriage. Okay. I know. We sorry. know. They, like, I know who would think of I'm that like, one? Um, I know, but I was like Southwest. I'm going. No, sorry. Okay, so sex workers for most of our marriage. I don't know details. No disclosure yet. He has been sober for five months and is doing some stuff for recovery. Not all that I feel he needs to, but much better than he was. He sees a sees that once a week and goes to four meetings a week. He is being honest with me. He does check ins. No sponsor yet. No book work yet. Uh, which um, whenever we get close, hold hands, hug or kiss. All I can think about is. Um, uh, is his penis has been in other women and I can't imagine ever having sex with him again. I feel like maybe I'm holding him back. I love him very much and I want to be with him, but is it fair for me to say, I don't know if I will ever be in a place where I can have sex with him again. So this is five months that he's been not acting out. Why don't you start Tammy? If that's okay. And I will follow you. Yeah. So, so what I hear is he's, he's doing some things, he, you know, it, it, could he do more? Sure. But you are honestly like, this is encouraging, you know, he's going to four meetings a week, you know, he's doing some things right. You know, so as far as like, you don't have to decide, you know, like, am I ever going to have sex with him again? I think you holding healthy boundaries for you, for you, um, is he asking for permission to hold your hand? Is he asking if it's okay to hug or kiss you? Like that would be important for me because it's, it's you getting to do that. Um, but lots of people, we've recommended this before on other webinars too. start with like sensate focus touch where it's like, okay, I'm okay with you, you know, holding my hand. I'm okay with you massaging my feet. I'm okay with whatever it is that you are okay with. Um, but until you have more clarity and maybe maybe some trauma work for you to you know because that imaging um uh you, it, you know i'm i know how that you can have a body reaction to that so so perhaps some trauma work for you just to you know help you know with that but it's still really early you know and um he still has a ways to go with rebuilding trust and it is your body and so i hope you've gotten an std test for you um, I hate to say that, but I really hope you've gotten an STD test because it is your body and I want you to take care of you. So Dr. Rob. Um, Jesus. Um, well, first of all, this is trauma, right? This is trauma when you start, um, well, there's a word for this, it's called um, intrusive thoughts which is, you know, they intrude upon you when you don't want them to, like you're being sexual, but then you start thinking, oh, he was with this person, that person, and you leave that and you start thinking about that. And then you just, you know, you're unable to be comfortable. So I think it's too soon. Um, sober five months is not very long. Um, he needs to do much better than he was. Yeah. I mean, he's working and that's great. And he's checking in and that's great, but maybe you're trying to push the, um, calendar here because I wouldn't be comfortable necessarily. How do I say this? I think when you have trauma, you have to start where you are, meaning maybe the best you can do is hold hands. Maybe the best you can do is take a walk together. Maybe you're not ready to touch each other. You know, maybe you hold hands and then when it gets to a back rub, that's uncomfortable. You start thinking about, it. so it's kind of like a um, dipping your toe in the water, seeing if you can tolerate that, then trying a little bit more. But at five months, I don't know, Tammy, I don't see um, the, any couple really being where they might want to be or she might want to be at five months. Do you have a thought? Well, I mean, some, I mean, there's lots of, oh, you know, don't have sex for 90 days and then have sex. And some betrayed, honestly, some betrayed partners want that connection. So, so I think it, what Dr. Rob is saying, like honor where you're at and it, and it's okay. And, you know, there's nothing that says, oh, at, you know, a certain day or a month or whatever that, okay, now you have to have sex and, and sex isn't, you know, if sex is about connecting well that's not true sex addicts prove all the time that sex is not about intimacy sex has, they it's that was transactional sex that you know he was having so so you know if the if 
if the purpose is connecting, what is going to help you feel connected in a real and meaningful way in the time frame that you can tolerate? So dipping your toe, going like, okay, I can tolerate that. Nope, that's too much. That's okay. And you know what? It can be, we held hands yesterday and today I'm not in a place where it's okay. You know, I think really honoring, you know, where you're at, having the conversations about this is like, I love you. I want to be with you. I like, I'm struggling with these feelings. I'm hopeful that we can navigate through this. The more work that you are doing, you know, like I see these actions and that's helpful. The more you do that, the closer I want to feel with you, you know, and it, it gives me hope. That's just real conversation, which is really what intimacy is about is being, you know, vulnerable. Ready for the next one? I am. Hi, my essay husband says he will kill himself before he acts out again. He suffers from depression and suicidal thoughts. He's on medication. He says this time he is committed to staying sober. This worries me and I'm not sure what to make of it. Um, so I, so I'm not sure exactly what the question is, Tammy here, like he's committed to staying sober, but what, what worries this person and what are they not able to make something of? So, so the, I, I'm going to, my concern on this is, um, any time I hear from an addict, oh, I'm never going to do that again. That's huge red flags for me. The, the thing I can't really address and um, would appreciate your thoughts on is, you know, if he suffers from clinical depression and suicidal thoughts, you know, I'm like, I'm almost going like, you know, I'm not asking for that perfection. Like, can we just be in the space where you're working on your recovery today? Like, you know, I, like it doesn't have to be the all or nothing. And, you know, so I'm wondering if the conversation could be, you know, from your standpoint, you know, like, let's not make it so black and white. Let's go with it for today. What are we both doing to be on a path moving forward? Because, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I wouldn't feel comfortable as a betrayed partner if somebody said, I'll never do that again, because it feels like they wouldn't be taking it as seriously as they should. However, I also, you know, like if somebody's going, well, I'll kill myself first, that, you know, that feels too extreme. So, but I really well, don't know with the clinical depression. So what do you think? Well, I, you know, I don't know this person, Tammy. So I obviously we need to be really careful about what I right. say, because I don't know his history or, or any of that, but I will say this addicts are manipulative. And if it gets you to shut up or leave me alone or be less angry at me, if I say, oh, you know, I'm just, again, I'm just not feeling like living, I will use that in order to shut you up and get what I want. I'll especially use it if it gets you to feel bad for me, even though you're the one I hurt. So I don't know to what degree this is true. Does it, and by the way, having thoughts, God, I don't, twice, once or twice a week, I don't feel like I, I got to leave this planet. I mean, everybody has thoughts about not wanting to be here, but um, here's a good question. Has he ever hurt himself before? Does he have any history of suicidality? Has he ever followed through on any of this? He cut on himself or hurt himself or, you know, so if there are, and by the way, this is why we run a treatment program. Seeking integrity is here because when somebody is struggling to stay sober, but their emotional issues are so great that when they're not acting out, they're overwhelmed or so they can't really deal with the things on their plate when they're sober because it's overwhelming them. Or somebody has a drug and sex problem and they put down the sex and they pick up that this is what treatment is for. This is what a treatment center is for is when someone is unable to put, get it together and cope and get where they need to get in the process. That's why we're here. And the other reason is if someone's in a major crisis and they just need to get some help right away. But I don't, I hear a lot about it in our treatment center, men saying, well, you know, I'm not really suicidal, but boy, when I say that, or, you know, it doesn't come out right away. It usually takes a week or so in treatment. They say, well, yeah, the truth is I wasn't really. So I don't know. I don't trust the things that come out of addicts' mouths. But on the, I'm also not in a particular situation where I could say anything because I don't want this person to harm themselves and have me weighed in. So I don't know the situation. But here's one other thing that, that, that comes to my mind is um, maybe you need to go to his therapy with him. I like that idea. Call his therapist and say, you know, I'm very concerned. He's saying all these things. He's doing, I don't know what to do. You know, I would really, I don't want to be involved in his therapy. I don't want, but I do need some advice and direction. Even if you, he can't call you back or she can't call you back, you can leave them a message and then it will get brought up in therapy because maybe you're the only one who's really 
hearing about this other than the, and medication doesn't mean therapy. Medication means seeing a psychiatrist and getting on medications. Um, so uh, I think we've spent a lot of time with this. I'm both suspect and concerned. If you're, yeah. And why, by the way, he won't kill himself before he acts out again. He'll kill himself after he acts out. You know, when you get to the point of wanting acting out, you're not thinking about anything except going and doing it. It's afterwards that you feel like crap and you don't want to live. So um, how about, well, I'm, I'm going to be gentle and say that I don't know enough, but I a, little, a bunch of red flags go up for me in this situation about, is this manipulative? Is this, is this a lot of things? Is there really therapy going on? I, I don't know. How involved are you? How much do people know about this? Lots more questions. I have answers for you, but hopefully that has been helpful. Yeah, no, I love that you suggest going to see his, uh, hopefully he's seeing a qualified professional. Um, I hear all the time people going to coaches and things that like, this is a high level mental health situation. So um, having an expert um, clinical person would be um, important. And if I'm going to say this in general, um, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. If you are not working with a qualified professional and need help finding one, email me and include where you're located so I can help you find somebody qualified in your area. Okay, next question. Betrayed partner here. My essay partner has done so many passive aggressive, backhanded, addict type things. I now find myself interpreting nice things he does as malicious. I just found his most recent secret device about a week ago. Not sure if active addiction is relevant here. He claims sobriety since. How do I view him in better light? Amy, again, I mean, I. I have lots of feelings about this. I, I'm like, um, why don't you go ahead and try? Well, and I'm like, why would you, myself? why would you view him in a better light? You just found another secret device a week ago. He, he, he claims, he, so he claims sobriety since addicts lip moving lying. So, um, so to me, interpreting nice things as malicious, I would not necessarily malicious. I would wonder about manipulative um, more than malicious. I would, I would see things as uh, I trust your gut. That's what I'm thinking, man, trust your gut. This is not a person in, on a recovery path. This is someone who's still, you know, uh, lying and hiding secrets. You, you discovered, you found it. He didn't bring this to you and go, Oh, here's my other secret device. And here's, I've talked to my sponsor and my qualified therapist. No, you found it. So it, it, he, at most, maybe has a week of abstinence, but I, I'm thinking that's giving being generous. So, yeah, I, 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 sorry, I, 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 um, my page just, I lost that. Hold on a second. Go away. You know when something pops up and you can't make it go away and it's taking up half yes. your screen. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, so. I go with Pam. It's like if someone's doing passive aggressive backhanded attic things, I, I would interpret them as being malicious. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with what you're thinking. And most recent secret device about a week ago. I mean, this person isn't, I'm not sure what you mean by not sure if active addiction is relevant. Uh, I don't even think he's ever been sober. So I, I, again, I, I don't hear anything about therapists. Is that true, Tammy? This Correct. may be a situation where maybe you want to call us and get a consultation. Uh, Tammy does them. Other folks, I do consultations and support sessions. It seems like you might need more direct direction. Does that make sense, Tammy? Mm -hmm. um, you may need to ask some specific questions because there's a lot in here. But to me, I read this like someone who needs more you, more information, more direction, more concrete stuff, because these are very vague questions. And they're vague questions, but based on what you're dealing with a week ago, they wouldn't be vague questions for me. So I think that some more information about all this whole process would be useful for you. Um, and maybe chat with one of us or write Tammy a note, see if we can get you uh, in a situation where you get more answers. Because um, I wouldn't care. You found a secret device a week ago. I don't care if he's sober or not. Why the heck are you lying to me about this device? I'd be so furious and... To me, it'd be like, we, well, it wouldn't be like, we're starting all over again from the beginning. So um, yeah, something is really not right here. And I think you need more information to be able to set your own boundaries and be safer. 
You're asking the right questions, but I think you need more specifics and you need help with that, my opinion. TAMI at Seeking Integrity. We give out lots of referrals. We don't get kickbacks, um, but we can support you in finding more information than we're able to give here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So he does a two hour expert consultation with couples. That could be a really useful thing for the two of you, just saying, but, but we do have 25 or 50 minute support sessions, myself and several members of our staff, completely different than Dr. Rob. So don't, you know, like it's completely different, but yeah, email me if you've got questions about that. It's also on the Seeking Integrity site. So, okay. So next question, my husband says he feels masturbation is something he doesn't want to do anymore, but he doesn't feel it as much as a betrayal as anything else. What are your thoughts on masturbation for an addict? And is it a betrayal on any level? He says if he's fantasizing about other women, he sees it as a betrayal that uh, just makes me feel like an object and definitely feels like a betrayal because I'm right here. Why do, does he have to fantasize about me? Hmm. Well, there's a number of questions here, right? So mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind telling me, why don't you pull them out one at a time? Because, so, you know, why does he fantasize yeah. about me is different than, yeah, thanks. So the first one, what are your thoughts on masturbation for an addict? And is it a betrayal on any level? Well, I think it's a betrayal if you feel like it's a betrayal, because you're the one who's feeling betrayed. And so it isn't up to me to say it's a betrayal. It's up to you to say, I feel betrayed. In the beginning of this process, I think taking a time out from sexuality period, 90 days or something like that, it's not gonna cure anything. But part of the reason why we do take some abstinence at the beginning is so that you don't worry. <laughs> it's exactly for this reason. So if you walk in the bathroom and we're masturbating, that's not gonna help you to feel a lot more comfortable about this whole process. It's just gonna make you more anxious and worried. So in the beginning, it might actually be useful, and I don't know how far along you are to just, if I were in early recovery and I, I would want to say, I don't want to worry my spouse. I don't want to make them. You shouldn't even have to ask about these questions. He should already be on top of this. So, um, the, the, so directly to the masturbation issue, um, some people, once they've stopped the whole thing for a little while, some people can go back to masturbation because without the intensity of looking at porn, it's just not a big deal for them. It doesn't do what they were used to. It doesn't have that intensity. So some people can over time, masturbate occasionally without it being a problem. Some people um, keep images in their head and they're so good at fantasy and so good at recalling them and six months after the porn's gone, they're still hot on the trail of those. So it's really something that we learn about over time. And if I, I would probably not be masturbating any of that stuff. And then I would talk to someone. What does my sponsor say? What does my therapist say? What does my group say? If I can give all of you addicts or any of you who are here to listen to me, here's the answer. Don't make decisions about your sexual life on your own. You can make decisions about paying your taxes. You can make your decisions about opening a new business. But when it comes to sex, you don't make good decisions. And so here's my suggestion. Don't try. I don't know what to do about masturbation. I'm not sure. Let me just go ahead and do it. No, let me talk to someone who knows me, who knows my situation. They'll tell me, try it out. Don't try it out. If I had a sponsor or a therapist and I was asking this question, the first thing they would say to me is, how do you think your spouse feels about this? You know, and maybe the most important part, and I haven't said this in a while, but I think it's really important is that, um, um, well, it's his job to make you feel better. It's his job to make you feel more at peace. It's his job to make you feel more trusting. Um, when I have a spouse, even in a non-sex addiction situation, say, you know, I really bothers me when you look at the porn, you know, let's talk about it. it makes me uncomfortable. And I look at it anyway. Basically what I'm saying to my spouse is I don't care what you think I'm going to do what I want. And this situation makes me think of someone who's thinking about what they want and when they want it and how they want it and how they can talk you into what they want rather than really respecting you. I think you are being treated like an object. And I think it does. It is a betrayal and you are right there. The one thing that I don't think you have really clearly yet is that our acting out is not about sex. So, and we have an intimacy disorder for a whole lot of reasons, usually having to do with our upbringing and ever, all of that stuff. I can't, when I am active in my addiction, I can be incredibly loving and kind and sweet to my partner if that's how I want to be. And also go over here and do what I want to do. Spouses often say, how could you love me and do this anyway? I I'm not really thinking about you when I'm doing this. And when I'm with you, I'm thinking about how I can hide it. Um, 
So you are an object until you're not. And if this person's still fighting for masturbation, trust your feelings. What I love here, Tammy, is this is someone who really has a good gut, you know, on what feels right and doesn't. I, I am glad you're coming here and checking it out. And I'm saying, and I think Tammy said, trust that gut. You're going in the right direction. And the fantasy part, it isn't about, it's about escaping you. It's about escaping the relationship. It's about disappearing into something else. He, he, we don't want to fantasize about you. We want to disappear into our anonymous craziness. So if I was going to fantasize about you, I probably wouldn't be a sex addict. Um, I want to fantasize about everyone in the world and just kind of keep you on a string. So you're being right there. I, I've worked with some of the most, and Tammy, I can't tell you who, but I've worked with with men who have truly have been with some of the most beautiful women in the world, like acknowledge magazine covers, movies. I live in Hollywood. I've had a couple of those clients. If you saw a name of how beautiful one of these women were, how famous they were, how famous they were for their beauty. And these guys are acting out anyway. It doesn't matter. It's not about them. It's about our craziness. And the faster you can say, wow, he's in his craziness again, rather than he doesn't want me the faster you, this will grow for you because it's just not about you. It affects you. It makes you feel terrible, but it's not about you. He had this problem long before he met you. So I want to start with the first sentence. My husband says he feels masturbation is something he doesn't want to do anymore. But then there's this whole justification. So I'm going like, mm, me thinks thou protesteth too much in that. Like if he doesn't want to do it, First of all, addicts, we always go, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. And the next thing you know, we are. But he's already given himself, well, if I'm just fantasizing about my wife, then it's really not bad. But but I hear you and, and understand if he's fantasizing about you, then I feel objectified. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, it's a struggle for um, uh, for partners of sex ad or porn addicts in particular, because those images can be rolling around and they're like, I feel like I'm having sex with him, but his head is somewhere else. And it, it, it takes intentionality to start to shift that. So, so I, I vote with you, like hold your boundary, understand. Um, but I would like to know if that's in his inner circle, like, like uh, just saying, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. But I really don't think it's a betrayal if I'm just fantasizing about you feels like, you know, I'm, I'm straddling the fence with that. So, okay, next question is, I am the betrayed partner. I'm three and a half years since discovery. My husband started SA and I started s and I'm still working with my therapist in 12-step program. My husband is not in program or working with a therapist. He believes that he will never act out in any way again. Um, I believe he needs program and therapy. He believes that he his past life in the sports world, me and his family were the reason. I believe I am I do not believe that I am the cause. I do not know if I have contributed, albeit unknowingly. So Tammy, what is the question here? Because there's a lot of statements. I have something I want to say about it, but is there a question you would want to respond I do to? not see a specific question in that, but um, you know, the I think looking for affirmation that I'm not the cause, you are not, um, you did not, nothing you did or didn't do, and the sports isn't, um, I, I, I would, uh, you know, from your standpoint, I would really work on having healthy boundaries because this is, I, I was talking to somebody doing a support session earlier today. And, um, uh, you know, I, sh you know, I have a daily reprieve. I've been doing this a while and like, I will not say, oh, you know, that was the reason. And I'll never do that again. I, I, it's just waiting. And I know people who have been sober you know for years or decades and they quit doing what they need to do and guess what then all of a sudden they're going like how did this happen i relapsed yeah and the other thing is recovery is not just not doing the acting out behavior it really is living differently and you know it you know it's showing up differently we started tonight with you know a question about you know how do i you know how do i get her back how do i do that it, it's about we show up differently we show up for other people in a, in a real way. And this is somebody that sounds like he's minimizing his risk at putting you, um, putting your relationship in, in harm's way. So. Yeah, I, I, um, 
I feel, I have a lot of feelings about this. I think this is, um, it feels like you're, you can't pull this cart by yourself in a marriage. You know, you cannot, we have a saying in therapy when we have a, a, someone who's a patient and I'm the therapist, one of the sayings is never work harder than your patient, right? Because if I give you things to do and I direct you and I support you and you don't do them, well, then I'm not going to like get investigate and work really hard because you're not doing your part. And, you know, if you need to go to meetings, you're not going to meetings, then that's what we're going to talk about. We're not going to do therapy. So, um, you know, I kind of feel the same way, like he's not doing his part. And so, and you're doing a lot. So what I would make up about all of that is that he doesn't, he thinks he's got this. And I don't mean got it like not working on it. I mean, he doesn't need, like he could just stop. I heard that. I think he's got it like you're handled. He's handled you. You know, mm. and he said this and he's done that and you just need to believe him. I'll never do this again and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter whether that's true or not to a certain degree. What matters is what makes you feel safe. <laughs> You're a betrayed partner. If you feel safe with him in program and therapy because you don't think what he did and is saying is accurate, then tell him that. But what is the other side of it? So you're three and a half years since this is coming out. And he's not doing anything about it. So it's kind of like what I said before. We know what the move is toward each other. Things are going well. What is your move toward distancing yourself? Because this is not going well. You cannot recover your relationship without him. And he can't recover the relationship till he does his recovery. And so my husband is not in program working with a therapist. You're wasting your time focusing on him because he's still the same person he was he's still telling the same lies he's still pushing you off he hasn't changed because he hasn't done anything and i bet this is someone who really believes that if they just work you the right way that you'll get they'll get you to believe anything they have to say the last thing you wrote is what i have strong feelings about also i do know that i may have contributed albeit unknowingly so now I have to do my thing, Tammy. I want every mm -hmm. spouse in the room and partner to take out a pen or a pad and write down the following. All of you spouses, please write this down. And I'm the expert. So if I said it, it must be true, okay? There's three things. One, there's nothing I have ever done. Spouses, there is nothing I have ever done. Second sentence, there is nothing I am doing. There's nothing I have ever done. There's nothing I am doing. Third sentence, and there's nothing I will ever do. Nothing I will ever do. So past, present, and future to make my loved one act out. And I was saying this to a couple I was talking to earlier. You can make him miserable. You can gain 100 pounds and nag him all the time and, you know, fight and scrap and, you know, spend all his money, whatever. And he can leave you. Or he can get a divorce, or he can get a therapist, or he can take up a hobby, or he can try to work on things with you. Or there are so many choices that I can make if I'm not happy in my relationship. You cannot contribute to my acting out. You can make him miserable, and maybe you contributed to his misery. I don't know what kind of marriage you have, but the decision to go and drink, the decision to go and use, the decision to go see that sex worker, that's my decision as an addict. I can blame you, but that's part of the problem is addicts want to say, well, it's over there and it's over there. And if she just wouldn't, I'm the problem. And any attempt I make to make someone else the problem is me not not really understanding the problem. I can't see problem over and over again. I am responsible for my actions. There's nothing you can do to make me do anything. I'm an adult. My choices are my choices. How I handle situations is up to me. If his decision about not being happy with you or you're contributing to his unhappiness is to go act out with strangers or whatever he does sexually, that's on him. Um, so please don't take responsibility, you spouses, for our behavior. You may not, we may not be happy with you. We can leave. But the logical conclusion, and by the way, it's just this couple I was talking to today, she actually said that she said, you know, why didn't you just leave me? I would have been happier rather than living with this mm -hmm. lie. I could have made decisions on my life. I don't care if you, I was making you miserable. Why did you have to do this? And the truth is because that's what he wanted to do. Um, so you cannot contribute. You can contribute to the problems of your marriage. You cannot contribute to someone making a decision about what they want to do with their life. Um, so please take that off your plate and all you spouses. Do you think they believe me, Tammy? I, I think it's I think it's hard for because they've been told by their addict that 
no, it really is you. And right. it, like, it's hard to start finding that truth and, and trusting your gut and going, no, it really isn't. It's not about me. You know, I'm I, 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 like you, you know, they'll go, well, I, you know, I should have done this or I should No, it's not about you. It, it is. That's hard when you've been gaslit and you've been manipulated for years or decades. It, you know, it's hard to have even the expert, Dr. Rob saying that and to have that sink in you know, to more than just, you know, top of the top of the brain. So. Well, I also want to say something else about having, which is, is about grief, which is when you're grieving something, remorse is a part of grief. So I had a family member pass away recently, this last couple of weeks. And I kept thinking to myself, I wish I'd said this, maybe we should have done that. Maybe I should have looked in on them soon. You know, when we have a loss, questioning Mm -hmm. ourselves and challenging Mm -hmm. ourselves is part of the grieving process. But don't believe it. You know, when you, this is, by the way, what support groups are for. And I didn't see, I saw Essen on, but what are you doing for you? Okay, I am still working with my therapist 12 step program. Are you raising your hand and saying, I feel like I'm still responsible? I feel like I'm contributing. I think you have more work to do in a, in a, uh, in a supportive way of separating yourself from the problem. And I agree with you, Tammy. You know what we say? It's so good. Um, well, if you just hadn't done that, or, you know, I wasn't thinking about this, but then you did this, or, you know, we have a million ways to tell you it's your fault. Um, and and it's not. Yeah, yeah. Because then, you know what? It lets us off. We're addicts. It lets us off the hook. So one more thing I'm going to say, because the s they often, I think, still use codependent language. And if you mm. have not already found it, um, Dr. Rob has a there's a book, but there's a podcast on, on sex, love, and addiction that talks about pro-dependence moving beyond or beyond the myth of codependency because there is no such thing as codependence. That's a whole nother lecture and we're going to run out of time, but please do not buy into the myth that, you know, that you're codependent, you're an enabler, that you're part of the problem. You aren't. So um, please, uh, and then that, I mentioned the work groups earlier, there's a betrayed partner work group that starts March 1st. It's from a pro-dependent lens. It's very, um, it's really good, but it really is looking at this as, gosh, you love somebody who's really struggling. You know, that doesn't pathologize you. And how can you set healthy boundaries for you that, you know, where you value you and take care of you. So. And I, I want to quickly explain the difference because it'll take mm-hmm. me two seconds to explain the okay. difference. Codependency says in, on some level, um, to the spouse, w- what's wrong with you for being this person? Why did you choose this person? Why did you stay with this person? Why did you? What is it in your background, your history? What is wrong with you? Basically, codependency says to spouses that you entered this situation or you stayed in the situation, and I think that's abusive. I already know why you stayed in the situation because you love them. I already know why you put up with all kinds of stuff because you love them, and that's what you do when you love somebody. And I don't need any more answers for the spouse. I don't need to look at their problems or where their history or all I need to know is you did your best to love with someone and they hurt you and you're really, really wounded and devastated. I don't think anyone would want to bring this about. Um, you know, do pe- couples have issues? Sure. Do they uh, make kind of, but sorry, I'm talking too fast. The bottom line is you can never be responsible for someone else's behavior. If somebody drinks, I'm not going to look at a spouse and say, oh, well, what are you doing to contribute to their drinking? That's codependency. What I'm going to do is say, I think you're amazing for having stayed with someone who's so troubled. Rather than questioning you about why did you stay? What's wrong with you? I'm going to say, of course you stayed. You love them. What a painful ride for you to love someone like this. You see the difference? I'm validating you for the love you give, for wanting to your family to stay together, for that's what pro-dependence is. I don't want to question your fidelity, your relationship, or how it has to do with your past. That's not relevant when you're in a crisis like this. So please don't let any therapist, any of you spouses again, uh, to give you this well. You know, your father was like this, and you know, it doesn't matter. Maybe that's true. Maybe you want to work on that three years from now or never. But to say that that you had some part in this happening or continuing is a lie. And to say that something from your history let somebody do this to you is a lie. You stayed with them because you love them. You're with them because you love what, you, what you've what you shared. You stay in the hopes that things will get better, not because you're trying to keep hurting yourself over and over again, because you want things to get better. You, partners, are our hope. You are the ones who hold out this vision for who we might be or who we might have been had we not made this mess. And boy, do we need you to pull ourselves out of that hole. Um, um, Let me say it this way, Tammy. 
what research tells us is that people who have family members who are loving and engaged do much better with recovery than people who don't have family and loved ones engaged. Codependent says disengage. I'm saying engage with boundaries and structure for yourself. So anyway, yeah, Prodependence. Good book. <laughs> It's a, it, well, it, it's a whole different lens. It's, a whole, it, it, it's not yeah. a, a different label. We're not labeling you. Now you're pro-dependent. No, it's a whole different lens of supporting, you know, and healing. Um, okay, so we're running out of time. We've got great questions yet. Okay, hi, thank you for helping us navigate. My sister-in-law is starting to ask questions about her brother, my essay husband. She can sense something is off and says he's distant. She invites us to stuff. And for the past 14 months, I've declined any invitations because I just don't want to be hanging around pretending life is okay with him. He has told his family nothing. They don't even know that we are separated, that we were separated before. My family knows there are issues, but not specific. Should I speak my piece? Should I ignore well, I, I, I think that by not showing up at all, you're giving him the entire, uh, you're giving him the opportunity to tell the whole story. And, you know, uh, he could be blaming He's you not, not saying sharing. anything. He's not saying anything. Right. He's, and so I, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead, Tammy. Well, to, yeah, so to me, um, so, so I, you know, we're seeking integrity. So in my integrity, I would have to say, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that you're reaching out, you know, and if, if you like your sister-in-law, I want to spend time with her separately, but you know, it's like, we, you know, we're having some personal issues. They are our personal right. issues. That's it, you know, um, but it's not for her to be nosy, you know, and um, if he's not willing to say, yeah, we're having some personal issues. It like, like Dr. Rob said earlier about telling the kids, you, you don't need your in-laws to know about your sex life or, you know, these, so we're having some personal issues. We're do you know, we're working through it. You know, it's taking some time. Um, if there's a safe way that you, like, if she's somebody that you actually like in your family and want to connect, say, I'm going to set the healthy boundary. I'm going to tell you that there's some issues. We're not, that's off the table. Happy to talk about kids or whatever, you know, set your healthy boundaries. What, what do you need or not need? Um, but somebody just poking around, digging, is just being nosy and i think in your own shame you're hiding out in ways that are not good for you or for the people or for the family because again you're the bad guy you're not showing. my wife went you know to your he says to his sister i can't believe she isn't showing up for anything she's so difficult how do they know it isn't all on you because you're not there and 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 so this i would put on you um, I would not want the family member to disappear from my life and just not show up anymore. And I would be hurt by that. And I don't know his family at all or anybody's, your, whatever it is. But I would probably say, if it were me, Tommy were my sister and I had missed Thanksgiving, I'd probably write and say, I'm so sorry. I, I haven't been to any events in a while. I don't know if you know this, but Jack and I are ha struggling with some things and I've just kind of been ducking out of the family. So, you know, have a voice. You don't have to say as Tammy details, but just, you know, I haven't been feeling comfortable with us as a couple. I've been kind of keeping my distance. You, I'm sorry I haven't been in touch. I'm sorry I haven't told you why. Um, because that is fair. You, that is on you that you've just completely let them in the dark. But you don't have to tell them every detail. You can just give them a clue. And as Tammy said, but if you'd like to have coffee, you and me. You know, if you want to go out for a holiday dinner, me and you, but not with my husband, you know, you don't necessarily, I don't know your relationship with them, but it's not necessarily that you don't want to see them. It's that you don't want to see them with him. Um, so as Tammy said, there may be people in that family are important to you or that matter to you or you matter to them. You don't have to cut yourself or them off from that. But just saying no is just actually makes you look bad. Like, oh, I guess she doesn't want to do anything with us. Well, why is it? Why is she so angry? Why is she, you know, you get blamed for that action. I think taking a more assertive stance would be helpful for you. And then he can't undermine you. Then he can't say, oh, well, see, she's not here again because she's such a, they all know, well, she's not here because you guys have problems. And that's a good thing um, for them to know that. Not what kind of problems, but again, you got to acknowledge people's reality. They obviously notice you're not there. They're making up stuff about it. He's telling them stuff about it. You probably need to have a voice of some kind. Yes, um, but I'm going to take off the good and the bad. I, like, I don't want it to be I say good moralized. And bad? I'm sorry. You said bad. It makes you look bad. And I'm going to, don't know. Oh, it, well. It, I'm, I'm going to take that off because, like, I, that's my personal thing. I don't, you know, it's not good or bad. It's like, you know, I, I would like you to be authentic. How can you show up for, and, and show up for yourself in a meaningful way? And if his family is toxic, you know, it it may be that you need to to keep that separation. Just say, you know, we're 
we're, you know, we're working on ourselves right now. We've had some, you know, some speed bumps and, you know, we're on it, nothing for you to worry about. And, and if they keep pushing, just say, please, you know, I, I ask you to respect my boundaries, please don't pry, whatever. Um, uh, but take care of you. But is there a way to do something that is authentic for you? Um, uh, you know, I, I agree with not wanting to show up and pretend like everything is okay. You, right. you don't have to do that either. Um, um, but you know, you can even have the discussion. Okay, I'm willing to go to the family thing. Understand, it's been 14 months, so there may be questions about. It. So good to see you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here too. Whatever. And here's here's one of my tricks. If you start asking people about themselves, they're happy to talk about themselves. So you can kind of do a deflect and just like, uh, you know, thanks for asking, and then turn it. I, it's been so long. I haven't seen you. And what? Like seriously, there's so many different tricks that you can, but have them planned it out in advance. So. We've got some questions. I just took a picture of them. We'll, we, I'll, I promise we'll bring them back next week. Um, yeah, there's a couple that were we'll really good. I want. I'm sorry we can't but, get to. But yeah, but we're way out of time and right, 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 right? on time. Yes. It's okay. True. All right. It's dinner time. All right. Thank you. But Dr. Rob is back. He'll be back. So join us again next week. Thanks, everybody. And treatment people. I'll be in the treatment center this week. So watch out. I'm coming in. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, Tammy.